welcome everyone. If you are joining and you need Spanish interpretation, you can please click the globe at the bottom of the screen and choose Spanish. Esta sesión está disponible en español. Haga clic en el globo. Te requiero en el parte inferior de la pantanalia en la sesión Selección Español. Thank you. Shelly? Thank you. Welcome. We are so excited to have you here with us today. And we are thrilled to be able to present Barriers to Diagnosis, Women and X-Linked Diseases and Disorders. We, we just wanted to say from HFA that HFA believes strongly in assisting, educating, and advocating. And we are really hopeful that this is the beginning of a critical conversation about all women who have X-linked mutations and the barriers they face when it comes to diagnosis and to treatment. HFA believes strongly that we start with the patient voice and I am thrilled we're going to be partnering with both Nord and Remember the Girls. And tonight we're going to start by bringing you Sharon, Carrie, and Deb, and we thank them for sharing their stories. I am certain that many women with X-linked mutations are going to find that you relate. And although we may carry different mutations for very different X-linked diseases and disorders, we have a lot in common. So we want to thank our sponsors, and you see the sponsor slide here, all of the wonderful sponsors who help make this possible. And um, we're, we're just thrilled that they can support this. And we're going to now play the video and introduce you to Sharon, Carrie, and Deb. My name is Sharon Lagas, and I'm a patient, caregiver, and advocate for Alport Syndrome. I co-founded the Alport Syndrome Foundation in 2007 when seven of my family members across three generations were diagnosed with this rare disease. Alport Syndrome is an inherited disease that causes kidney failure, hearing loss, and eye problems due to a collagen mutation. There are several genetic types of Alport Syndrome, but the most common is the X-linked form of the disease. My family has X-linked Alport syndrome. My mother passed the gene to my brother and I, who then passed it on to our children. Two of my three children, my two boys, inherited Alport syndrome from me. Alport syndrome is uniquely devastating because it causes young adults, 20 to 30 year olds, mostly male due to the X-linked inheritance, to go into renal failure, kidney failure, during critical times in their lives. Imagine starting a career, a family, um, or college and having that derail because of this disease. Based on these experiences, Alport syndrome has been viewed by the medical community as a male disease. Females have been traditionally labeled as carriers. Being viewed as a carrier is a barrier to diagnosis and treatment. I have 40% kidney function, so clearly I'm not a carrier, but have the disease, just a different progression. I was not diagnosed or treated until I was in my 40s after my boys were diagnosed. My story is not unique, and statistics show that 95% of women with Alport syndrome have hematuria, blood in their urine, which is the first sign of the disease. 15% of women with X-linked Alport syndrome will go on to have kidney failure by age 40 and 30% by age 60. Further evidence that women are not just carriers, but are patients impacted by the disease. Being labeled as a carrier prevents women from getting the treatment they need earlier in the disease to prevent progression, which is critical in preserving kidney function. Compounding this problem for X-linked diseases is the guilt that mothers feel passing it on to their children, particularly their sons. Mothers then tend to fully focus on their children's care and not advocate for their own, as I did. The Alport Syndrome Foundation has been working with all stakeholders to change this narrative and get earlier diagnosis and treatment for women with the X-linked form of this disease. We work with clinicians to stop using the term carrier. We publish articles to disseminate this message to the clinical community. We remind every woman that contacts us that her health is just as important as her children's. And we have a dedicated section on our website for women that states clearly, you are not a carrier. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gary Burns Raker, and I am a girl hemophiliac. And I have two X's, and one of them is has a mutation for hemophilia, 
and the other one is apparently fine, except one of them, the hemophilia one, turned on more than the one that didn't. So I ended up with a, a factor level of about 29. And I was diagnosed officially when I was 28 years old um, after a near fatal postpartum um, hemorrhage and a disastrous circumcision of my baby boy. But uh, you'd think that get, getting diagnosed is the battle, right? Um, and in some cases it's part of the battle, but it's not because getting diagnosed and having treatment are two completely different things. So I, they wouldn't give me factor. So I didn't have any medication to treat at home if I had a bleed or, um, you know, if I needed something, I was having something done or, you know, I had to go to outside hematologists and outside treatment centers to get actual plans for things like babies because they were going to let me bleed to death. And I just shouldn't have to fight. You shouldn't, but we do. And then my babies were girls, two of them. So they're both mild hemophiliacs, diagnosed at birth, and they were also refused any kind of medication, no stymate, no anything, transesthetic acid, nothing, just nothing. And so when I asked for um, factor for my daughter, the oldest daughter, um, who's hitting pubescence and needed it for her period, they took away my factor and then took away my voice factor. And my severe sons, you, you know, really need their factor, but so do my mild girls. And so we fought, there was a big fight, like a big fight. And I eventually successfully um, got my factor returned, my boys factor returned, and I got factor for my baby girl and my older girl. So now all five of us have factor at home and we still fight. Doctors don't believe we exist. The girls, go to, if we have to go to the emergency room, it's usually a nightmare because they don't, they don't believe in us. And it's very awkward when you go to a doctor who doesn't believe in you. So we try to avoid emergency rooms if we can. But the fight continues and I'm not going to stop fighting. I shouldn't have to fight, but I'm going to until every single girl has a treatment she needs and is treated appropriately. So not they call their names, they call us crazy, they say we're attention seeking, they were horrible people. None of that should be happening from your doctor or your hematologist or your treatment center. You deserve to be treated like the mild hemophiliac that you are, but with additional bleeding because you're a girl, which is kind of a downside. But that's so, I'm gonna keep fighting and fighting and fighting until we become real to every doctor. Okay, it's nice to meet you, thank you. Hello, my name is Deb. I'm a carrier of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. My brother had Duchenne and my identical twin daughters are manifesting carriers. They're 12 years old. My daughter Megan has mild symptoms, but my daughter Sarah has full on symptoms like a boy would have. We noticed developmental delays early on with Sarah and Megan, which doctors attributed to their premature birth. But as they got older, I started to notice that some of their movements mimicked what I had seen my brother do growing up. It took 18 months um, to convince doctors to test my girls for Duchenne after I first recognized the symptoms. Had I not recognized the symptoms, who knows when they would have finally been diagnosed. Since then, it's been an uphill battle. We've seen specialists who have flat out told me that girls can't get Duchenne. When they were prescribed steroids, which is a common Duchenne treatment, I was handed a two page fact sheet explaining side effects for long term steroid use in boys. There are lots of potential treatments and work and drug trials underway, which is great. But despite trying for years, I couldn't get anybody to enroll my girls in a drug trial for no other reason than the fact that they are girls. People running the trials say that they don't want variability in data because that can hurt with um, drug approval, but the disease affects everybody differently. So there's variability between male participants anyway. What's worse is there are so many treatments and trials that they can't even find enough participants, yet they still won't enroll girls. A couple of years ago, um, we were granted access to one experimental drug through FDA's Compassionate Use Program. So we're very thankful for that. And we hope that the data they're gathering from my girls will pave the way for girls to have access to the drug once it's approved. But when other more promising treatments are approved and available, how can we be sure that they're safe for girls and women if they haven't been tested in girls and women? And how can we ensure that insurance will cover them for a demographic that they haven't been tested on? I think awareness um, that girls can have Duchenne has grown in the past eight years since my girls were diagnosed. 
but there's obviously still more work to do as far as educating the medical community and the researchers that are developing and testing potential treatments. Thank you. I am so thankful to um, our amazing patients who shared their story. Thank you so much. I think that many of us see common themes when, when we deal with the realities of the struggles with X-linked um, mutations causing different diseases and disorders. So what I want to do right now is I first want to alert you to the fact that there is a, a place on your screen where you can ask questions. So go ahead and send those questions in during the chat or during the presentations. Our plan is to let all three of our presenters present to you, and then we're going to open up a Q&A section at the end. So if you send us those questions, we will make sure to bank all of them, read through them, and answer as many as we can when we get to the Q&A portion. So I'm going to introduce all three of our speakers right now, and then they will come in succession, and we are in for an amazing treat. These, these women bring to us so much information about the, the realities of living with an X-linked disease or disorder and, and the struggles. So our first speaker will be Taylor Kane. She has spent most of her life as a rare disease advocate. She is the founder and executive director of Remember the Girls, an international nonprofit that unites, educates, and empowers female carriers of X-linked genetic disorders. Taylor's activism began when she was in grade school shortly after her father died from the rare X-linked disorder, adrenoleukodystrophy, otherwise known as ALD, and she learned that she was a carrier of this devastating disease. She is an award-winning activist, an accomplished speaker, and a respected author, having recently published a memoir, Rare Like Us, From Losing My Dad to Finding Myself in a Family Plagued by Genetic Disease. Our second speaker is going to be Kristen Angel. Kristen is the Associate Director of Advocacy for the National Organization for Rare Disorders, known, also known as NORD. Kristen oversees the Rare Action Network, RAN, program at NORD. RAN is the grassroots advocacy arm of NORD. She works with rare disease patients, families, organizations, industry leaders, medical professionals, and elected officials spanning across all 50 states on public policy and advocacy initiatives to improve the lives of those impacted by rare diseases. With over 15 years of advocacy experience, Kristen is devoted to empowering individuals in the community to advocate for change and raise awareness on many social issues. And our final speaker is going to be Dr. Rebecca Spencer, MD and PhD. She is a practicing anesthesiologist at Concord Hospital in New Hampshire. In her clinical practice, she consults for patients with X-linked and other rare diseases. Her PhD research focused on X chromosome inactivation. Dr. Spencer received her MD and PhD degrees, PhD degrees from Harvard and trained in anesthesiology at Massachusetts General Hospital. She is a member of the Medical Advisory Board for Remember the Girls. So with that, I am going to turn it over to our first speaker who is Taylor King. Thank you so much, Shelly. Um, I am going to share my screen. And can you hear me okay? Great, great. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much um, for, for being here for this event. Um, you know, we've had so many conversations about this topic, and I'm so excited to finally be speaking about this topic on a larger scale. Shelly, back over to you for these two slides. Thank you. So just looking at who is HFA, we were founded in 1994 as a national nonprofit education that assists, educates, and advocates for the bleeding disorders community. Go ahead. And, and we actually thanked our sponsors before we played the video. So we are good to go. We're very appreciative of their support. And back to you, Taylor. So I'll start off um, with talking a little bit more about why I'm here today. Um, Shelly touched on my X-Link story a little bit, but just to go into more detail, um, my dad, Jack, was diagnosed with adrenal leukodystrophy or ALD in 2001 um, after experiencing some behavioral changes. Um, you know, he was in his late 40s, so my mom thought maybe he was going through a midlife crisis. Um, a counselor ended up 
suggesting that he get an MRI of his brain would show that he did have demyelination of the white matter in his brain. Um, ALD is a neurological condition, and soon after this MRI, he was diagnosed with ALD. Um, at the same time, my family was told that ALD follows an X-linked inheritance pattern, and this meant that I am a carrier of the condition. Um, you know, at the time, of course, my family's focus was on my dad. My mom started looking for anything she could about ALD, which, you know, especially then there wasn't too much to find. Um, but as far as I was concerned, you know, my family was told this is something I would just have to worry about when I was ready to have kids one day. Um, you know, they said women don't get the disease. Girls are completely fine. This disease is only in boys and men. So your daughter has nothing to worry about. Um, and, you know, this can be revisited when she's ready to have kids. Um, over the years, my my dad bought, got progressively um, more ill. As you can see in the photo, uh, this is me feeding him in um, in his hospital bed. Um, well, when he was still able to eat, eventually he did lose the ability to swallow um, and went on a feeding tube. And he passed away um, in 2003 when I was in kindergarten. Um, being that I was, you know, always around ALD um, for those two years of my life, I, I knew what the disease was. Um, my mom was really always open with me about my carrier status, and I really don't remember a time in my life where I didn't know that I was a carrier. Um, today, I'm, I'm 23, and I think my mom first told me when I was about seven or eight years old, um, and over the years, she would re-explain to me what it meant to be a carrier. She would draw out, you know, X chromosomes and Y chromosomes and explain to me that I had a 50% chance of passing down this condition. Uh, this photo of me in the middle of the screen is when I visited the Kennedy Krieger Institute and first met with a genetic counselor when I was 12 years old. Um, I also met with an ALD specialist. Um, and this is really when I learned that there was the possibility of experiencing symptoms someday. Um, but given that this was over a decade ago now, um, which is crazy, um, a lot has changed when it comes to women in the ALD community. Uh, back at, when this photo was taken, when I was 12, you know, it was thought to to be incredibly rare for women with ALD to manifest symptoms um, and that, you know, these symptoms were very, very mild. And I'll get into this a little bit more later, but, you know, a lot has changed. We now know that over 90% of women with the ALD gene do experience symptoms. Um, and these symptoms, you know, definitely can be quite severe. Um, over you know, the course of, of my life, I've gotten more involved in advocacy, um, especially for ALD and excellent conditions, um, which I'll talk about when I speak about Remember the Girls as an organization. Um, but in high school is when I really took to social media and started connecting with the ALD carrier community specifically. Um, my mom had made sure that I was still attending ALD Connect and United Luca Dystrophy Foundation events. She would take me to those, um, even though I was the only one now in my immediate family who had ALD since my dad passed away. Um, at these conferences, I did notice that a lot of carriers, you know, had walking difficulties. They were using canes, they were using walkers, they were using wheelchairs. And I remember being in high school and being a little confused because I definitely saw a pattern that wasn't being talked about. Um, carriers were only spoken about in the sense of being, you know, a caregiver or being the person who passed the mutation down to a son. Um, if anything, you know, carriers were said to have these mild symptoms. Um, and I could just see with my own eyes that that really wasn't the case. Um, I definitely felt a lot of isolation and I turned a Facebook group um, I created a Facebook group specifically to meet other young adult carriers. Um, at the time I was 16 and most carriers I had met were, you know, in their late 20s, 30s or older. Um, given that a lot of them found out only after having a son who was diagnosed with ALD, I knew that I was in a very lucky position, you know, knowing earlier in my life. Um, but I did want to meet some other young carriers so I could talk with them about things you know, that I didn't have anyone else to talk about, you know, when all my friends were talking about, about dating, I was the one who had to think of, oh, how am I going to tell someone I'm dating that I'm a carrier of this, you know, potentially fatal condition and that, you know, this is going to affect my future. As I said, um, and as you know, this is the entire point of the webinar, um, I started doing more research, not only on carriers of ALD, but just started learning more about other X-linked diseases. Um, I'm going to be honest, it, it, 
I definitely went for years knowing ALD was a rare disease, knowing it was X-linked, but not knowing there was all these other rare diseases and X-linked diseases out there. Um, but when I started doing research, my, my mind was blown. I saw that the issues we were facing in the ALD community, you know, the fact that so many women were experiencing symptoms, yet we weren't, you know, being included in studies. We, we didn't have any access or an involvement in any trials. We weren't seen as being part of the patient population. We were seen as just carriers. I noticed that this was something that was happening across so many different X-linked diseases. And from that moment on, I just knew that something had to be done about this. Um, I knew that in the ALD community, we were fighting really starting to you know, fight really hard. Um, there was many women in our, my community who came before me who were already you know, speaking out about the fact that carriers were not just carriers, that we were women with ALD. Um, and I, I knew that this was happening in other communities too. And I just needed us to all come together. Another thing I wanna mention is, you know, beside physical symptoms, there's a lot of other things that our, our community faces. Um, um, this photo on the right um, is Typhoid Mary, who is the infamous um, carrier of typhoid. Um, she, I saw, I was reading a paper um, a couple years ago, a very old paper, and I saw it comparing genetic carriers to carriers of an infectious disease like typhoid Mary. And, you know, a lot of stigma was placed on her um, saying, oh, she was passing the disease on, but she wasn't getting affected. And this article is basically comparing that to how carriers, especially with excellent conditions, we aren't affected, but we pass the disease on and, um, you know, effectively hurt other people, but don't get hurt ourselves. And I was just so frustrated reading that, um, you know, there's so much stigma associated with the term carrier itself. Um, we're assumed to be unaffected. We're assumed to, you know, have very mild symptoms and, and can't possibly be as bad as male patients, which we know in many excellent diseases, women actually can be affected just as much as men. Um, you know, it might be less common, but it's, it's still something that can happen. Um, additionally, many of us also face a variety of, you know, mental and social effects as well, like guilt, blame, especially if, if you have passed down an excellent condition. Um, I know one that I feel a lot is just fear for the future, a lot of uncertainty. I know that my chance of developing symptoms is really high, um, but I there's nothing that I can do except wait until that happens. Um, and that's definitely a very hard space to be in. As I said, when I learned that there was all these other excellent diseases, I felt so mobilized in that moment to, to do something. Um, and in 2017, I formed Remember the Girls, um, which is a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to improving the lives of women with excellent conditions, also known as carriers. Um, Remember the Girls is also an international organization. Uh, today, we have over 1,200 group members. We have a private and closed Facebook group, um, which I will definitely send the link in the chat um, once I've done my portion. Um, so, so some people in this group can join if they're not in it already. We also represent over 30 different excellent conditions, and we have members in over 25 different countries. And I've just been blown away by, you know, seeing how when these women come together from these different excellent communities, they have the same like, wow, mind blown feeling of, I didn't even know that this was happening, not only in my own community, but in all these different excellent diseases. And I feel like that feeling of empowerment is just so relevant in the organization. Um, and even though we're from different rare conditions, you know, it still does come back to the fact that these are excellent diseases. It also definitely has a gendered aspect to it, in my opinion. You know, the fact that it is, you know, the the biological females who are the carriers um, and the organization as a whole um, we're dedicated and focused on awareness so just awareness that the fact that women can get symptoms awareness of excellent conditions in general uh, support as we know being a woman with an excellent condition can be incredibly isolating advocacy um, including legislative advocacy and something that we definitely um, plan to get more involved in, in the coming years is is research we have three main focuses um, that a lot of our programming and educational materials focus on. Uh, the first one being physical symptoms and really highlighting the fact that um, so many women in excellent communities do experience physical symptoms. Um, another one is the reproductive and family planning options. Um, 
we're not really talking about that a ton in, in, in this meeting specifically, since we are focusing more on barriers to diagnosis. But as we know, women with excellent conditions do have a 50% chance of passing the condition down. And I know from a young age, I personally felt very, you know, very glad that when I was older, that there were options for me. Um, but then as I started learning about the cost and all the barriers that that can come into play when affording these options, um, it's definitely very discouraging. And we want all women in our community to have access to any family planning option um, that, that is right for them. And also focusing on the psychosocial side effects and mental health for our community. But on top of these, there are so, so many more. Um, oh. I'm sorry, this phone keeps ringing. Just give me one second. I'm so sorry. I'm in a hotel room right now and I think they're trying to call me, but they'll have to wait. Um, there are so, so many more, you know, issues that we haven't even begun to tackle yet um, in the organization, but that we definitely plan to, you know, especially working alongside other excellent um, and rare disease organizations uh, like HFA and NORD. Um, some of these are involvement in research and especially clinical trials. Um, I definitely connected with what um, Deb said um, in her video. She mentioned how, you know, if, if these drugs are only tested in male patients, you know, how do we know that they're going to work in females? And that's definitely something happening in the ALD community as well. There are ongoing trials for men um, with the later onset form of the condition, but we don't know if, you know, these treatments will be effective for women or if women will be able to get approved. And it, that's just a big question mark. Um, discussing carrier status to intimate partners, disclosing carrier status to daughters or other family members. I know when, you know, my family found out that my dad had ALD and we had to go tell, you know, my dad's siblings, his parents, our extended family, that's, I mean, I don't remember it because I was really young, but based on hearing my mom's stories, I know that that was something that was really hard. Um, and also finding doctors that are informed on female symptoms. Many of us, I'm sure, have heard, you know, horror stories of going to a doctor and saying, you know, I, I have ALD or I have hemophilia and them simply saying, that's not possible. You can't have that because you're a woman. Um, and that's just something that we really, really need to work to change. And I think that awareness, especially in the medical community is such a big part of that. We also really focus on just drawing attention to what matters. You know, I think that a lot, a lot of times people will speak for communities without actually involving them in the conversation. Um, wait. So, for example, um, I won't go into too much detail, but there was a, a decision in one country not to screen um, baby girls born in the hospital for ALD. And one of the reasons that the government said was because it's too emotionally disturbing. Their words, not mine, to be a carrier. And I, I asked if they asked any carriers if, if it's so emotionally disturbing to be a carrier and they did not consult any carriers of ALD in their decision-making. Um, and I was just so frustrated by that because, you know, I think people and stakeholders, they make assumptions about our community. They make assumptions that, you know, girls don't want to know that they're carriers because they'll be too upset. And, you know, no one wants to be a carrier. It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not something that's, you know, a good thing I would say, but it's like, there's just all these assumptions out there that people are making about us and they're not asking us. So that's a gap that Remember the Girls is really working to fill. Um, these are just two polls here. One's about family planning and one is about um, when, you know, parents should be able to get their daughters tested, determine whether they're carriers. Um, this is just in our Facebook group. So, you know, this data isn't like, you know, this is just a poll. So it's not like a study or anything like that. Um, but we do a lot of these internally to really try to get like the opinions and, and have an open discussion about these issues that matter to us. Um, and then also we've started creating like statements where we post on our blog, um, a statement from the organization, like and from our voice. So we're definitely going to do more of that. I want to also touch generally on the barriers to genetic testing. Um, this is something that affects our community a lot, especially um, in ALD with the rise of newborn screening. Um, many states now screen for ALD and are also screening um, girls for the condition as well. Um, so many girls at birth are now finding out their carriers, um, but many 
you know, genetic testing places won't test potential carriers until they're 16 or 18. So there's definitely a very, you know, unequal, um, you know, unequal way that the rules are applied here. Um, and, you know, this definitely hurts the excellent community because the reason that we struggle to access screening is because we're seen as just carriers. And we're told that since we're carriers, the disease doesn't affect us until we're older. So we don't need to know early. And as we know, for a lot of Xing diseases, not particularly ALD, but definitely hemophilia, um, girls who are who have the gene definitely need to know when they're young. Um, you know, they can have experienced symptoms when they're in childhood, you know, I guess from as early as when they're born. Yet there's all these policies, you know, and statements and positions that these big organizations have that exclude, you know, and recommend that you don't test a carrier until they're 16 or 18. Um, and, you know, a lack of testing just causes a lack of access to treatments, a lack of access to preventative care. I know that if there was something that I could have been doing my whole life to, you know, possibly help um, prevent symptoms from coming on until later, I know I would have done that. Um, and also just psychological adjustment. This one is huge for me personally, because I, I can't speak for everyone's experience, but I'm a huge advocate for, you know, girls being able to know that they are affected by excellent conditions from a young age. I grew up knowing that I had ALD and honestly, I never can remember ever feeling scared. I just thought like, it's a part of me. It's something that, you know, my dad had too. I knew that I wasn't going to, you know, suffer the same fate as my dad. And it was just part of me. Like I grew up knowing I was a carrier and knowing that I had the ALD gene and that was just life. <laughs> Some more things that we're currently working on and remember the girls, um, we do internal support initiatives, which happen mostly in our Facebook group. Um, every month we highlight a different excellent disease. Um, we do this because we found that, you know, many women who join our group, you know, as one would, they don't know much about other excellent conditions. Um, so, so we really try to highlight these different excellent conditions so we can just grow that, you know, community even stronger within our group. We also have an ambassador program. Um, when we have new members join, they have the option of being paired with an ambassador in their condition. We hold topic specific webinars. Um, we post a lot of edu educational content on social media. Um, this is an example of one we do on the right. Um, we are per creating a family planning toolkit where we're outlining all the different reproductive options available and family planning options available to X-linked women, um, including testimonial videos and videos from genetic counselors. Um, we're also working on self-advocacy guidelines. As we all know, self-advocacy is a huge component of being a woman or a girl with an X-linked disease. Um, you know, the word we, we have to fight for, for, for what we need. I saw a comment that's saying it is frustrating that we have to fight and yeah, it is, but we just have to keep doing it until the, you know, the people that come after us don't have to fight anymore. So it is frustrating, but we are working on these guidelines to help kind of ease that process. Um, and, you know, what to bring to a doctor's appointment, you know, if you should print out research papers, if you should do this, you should do that. Um, I think this is also incredibly important when it comes to women. Um, as we know, there's long been a gender bias in medicine and that women's symptoms generally are not believed. Um, and or thought to be related to anxiety, depression, stress, motherhood, et cetera. Um, so we also have that weighing on our shoulders as well. So that's something that the guidelines are going to address. Um, and also, as I mentioned, we're working on um, legislative advocacy as well. All in all, you know, we've made a lot of progress as an organization and, and working with so many other great organizations, but we, we have such a long way to go. Um, this webinar itself is such an amazing step forward. Um, one thing that I do want to address is that many excellent communities have dropped the term carrier altogether. Um, ALD is one of them. Um, you know, I think terminology is something that we definitely have to address as a larger community. Um, in my opinion, the term carrier just works to hurt us more than it does to help us. Um, more excellent women are being included in research and in some conditions and trials, which is a very positive thing. Um, yet many medical professionals still don't know that excellent women can experience symptoms. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, when a lot of these medical professionals were in medical school, they probably had, you know, a 10 minute thing on excellent conditions. And at the time they probably just learned, you know, X-linked affects men. Um, so 
that re-education and continuing that education on excellent conditions based on what we know now is so important. There's still a major lack of access to informed doctors, social support, family planning options, genetic testing and treatments for physical symptoms. Um, and I personally, you know, talk a lot about, about the term carrier and why terminology and the label carrier can be so harmful to our community. Um, and one of the main like slogans or hashtags you could say, I remember the girls is not just carriers. And this really came about because my whole life, I just remember when, you know, when I or my mom would tell people like, oh, you know, Taylor's a carrier of ALD, um, you know, so that means she's, she's not going to like have the condition in the same way her father did. And everyone's response was like, oh, she's so lucky she's just a carrier. Or if I ever brought it up to any doctor, oh, well, you're just a carrier. You have nothing to worry about. And I just heard over and over again, you're just a carrier, just a carrier. And I started to wonder like, what does it mean for these people to think I'm just a carrier? Like, yes, at, at this moment in time, I don't have symptoms, but I still carry this gene in me. Like I have a whole life with this condition ahead of me. And I just, I just hated hearing that. So I know that that's something a lot of um, women in our community can relate to. So I just want everyone to know, you know, that we are not just carriers. Um, I want to end on a positive note. So even though I mentioned that we still have a lot of work to do, you know, events like this one are just so important to keep talking about this topic, keep having these important conversations. I know we have a great attendance of both patients, advocates, medical professionals. Um, so this is just a perfect way to, to keep this conversation going. Um, here's ways that you can get in touch with me, um, follow Remember the Girls. As I said, I will send the closed Remember the Girls group in the link if you, if uh, in the chat, if you want to join. Um, but that is all. Um, thank you so much um, for letting me speak about, about Remember the Girls. And I'm really excited um, for the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Kristen, I wrote your name. Thank you, Taylor. I'm here. Uh, sorry, my screen froze for a moment there. <laughs> um, good evening or good afternoon for some folks, wherever you're calling in from today. Um, I'm Kristen Angel, I'm the Associate Director of NORD, the National Organization for Rare Disorders, and I'm happy to be here tonight. Um, I, we are an umbrella organization. We represent approximately 25 to 30 million Americans living with a rare disease. I know we've heard about different conditions tonight, um, all that fall under the rare disease umbrella. And the definition of a rare disease is if it affects less than 200,000 of the US population, it's considered rare. There's currently over 7,000 rare diseases and that number continuously changes with new research um, and developments. And more than 90% of rare diseases are currently without an FCA approved treatment indicated specifically for that disease. NORD focuses on <clears throat> representing the entire rare disease community as an umbrella organization. So when we work on initiatives, research, or all the different things I'll, I'll share about our organization tonight, um, we focus on the common challenges rare disease patients face, many of which we've heard tonight from all of the speakers so far. Um, it takes on average five to seven years for an accurate diagnosis. Um, there's extensive lifelong medical needs. There's a high cost of care and treatment few medical experts, little research known about the diseases, um, small patient populations, and of course, social isolation, which is, which is a big one. We address all of these challenges through very, er, various areas of our work here at NORD and, and continue to incorporate the patient voice in everything we do in all of our work. NORD is divided up into these four pillars. Um, we have policy and advocacy work. We work in research, we work in patient services, and we work in education. Public policy in advocacy is NORD's foundation. We were actually founded by a group of um, patient advocates that were advocating for change uh, and NORD helped uh, get the 
Orphan Drug Act uh, passed into law back in, in 1983, which then uh, resulted in the birth of NORD. So public policy has always been on the forefront for us. We work both on federal and state level. We work on regulatory affairs and we advocate by hosting um, training workshops uh, in a pre-COVID world in-person workshops and trainings. And uh, we would do Hill Days. Uh, and we also offer virtual opportunities and on-demand trainings for advocates. Some of the um, things that we actually advocate for uh, involve access to affordable and adequate coverage, um, access to affordable medications, diagnosis, um, innovative medicines and therapies, clinical trials, um, advancing rare disease research and regulatory science. Um, COVID-19 is another area we've been very um, prominent in the last two years. Uh, it's impacted the rare disease community entirely. Um, rare disease advi advisory councils, which um, are basically uh, all stakeholders of the rare disease community in certain states have these councils in place. They work with the legislative body in the state to recommend on any policy issues that could be directly impacting the rare disease community in their state. Uh, we work on telehealth initiatives and each year um, NORD publishes, which uh, will actually be coming out in the next few weeks, uh, a state policy report card, so a state of the state's report. And this actually shows um, how your state uh, grades on certain um, issues that fall under these umbrellas that I, that I just uh, shared with you. Through our Rare Action Network, um, it's a grassroots advocacy-based network spanning across all 50 states. Um, we have our rareaction.org with information that has all of the bills and issues we're working on, any specific calls to action. Um, and one of the most uh, heavily trafficked areas are the state profiles, uh, the state specific pages where we have state specific resources and information. Um, we have a volunteer state ambassador program. So we actually have volunteers across the country that are our ambassadors and represent the rare disease community and represent NORD on our behalf in their state. Um, they work to connect patients and families to information and resources. They work directly on getting legislation passed and calls to action and building a network of rare disease advocates in their state. They work on rare disease day events. Um, and I'll share about rare disease day soon. Um, they work on the federal and state advocacy campaigns and also they assist in the training and education and awareness events. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the state policy report card is a great tool for our ambassadors when they're working with um, state legislators to show them how, how their state is faring and how they can help to improve the lives of rare disease patients and their family. NORD's Patient Assistance um, and Information Resource Center is uh, really probably our biggest department at NORD. We do quite a bit, and I'm going to summarize this very small, and I'm sure our, our patient services team could spend an hour alone just talking about the services we offer, but we support patients and families in a number of ways. Uh, we do have a call center, so you can call um, our communication center and be connected to a patient service representative to help you with information you're seeking, um, any patient assistance programs that we have available that you may qualify for. Um, the staff is, is, is super dedicated, and they're just um, always there to help support the rare disease community um, all the time, and they're, they're fantastic. Um, NORD's patient assistance programs, we help with medical expenses not covered by insurance, health insurance premiums or copay expenses, underinsured. Um, we have travel and lodging assistance programs to get to clinical trials. Um, we do a rare disease educational support program to uh, help folks that may not have the means to travel to a uh, patient conference that is specific to their disease, uh, we have assistance programs to help uh, cover the costs of attending those conferences um, and virtual as well, because we do have assistance programs to help waive some of, sometimes there's a cost associated with attending those programs and NORD has a program for that. Um, we also have a medic alert assistance program and a rare caregiver respite program, uh, which helps to alleviate some of the financial burden to find uh, proper care for your loved ones uh, if a caregiver needs respite. NORD also has a membership department, and the membership department is actually for our, five, our 501c3 nonprofit patient organizations, such as HFA, who are our longstanding members of NORD. 
Um, by being a member organization of NORD, it gives you access to staff, FCA, um, event passes to events that we're hosting or attending or partners with, um, media connections and connections to industry. Um, we offer trainings to our nonprofit organizations through monthly webinars and virtual events and in-person events and roundtable discussions with leaders. We have a mentor program through our Facebook community for nonprofit patient organizations. Um, we offer promotion of NORD member organizations, events, activities, and conferences. And then we also have a rare launch program, which is a really exciting program. It's been around for a few years and it recently relaunched. And this program is specifically designed to help um, individuals overcome barriers of having to start a nonprofit uh, for their specific disease. Um, there's many diseases, as I mentioned, 7,000, and there are not uh, 7,000 organizations dedicated to those specific diseases. So an organization or groups that are formed on social media and are ready to take that next step into uh, developing a 501c3 nonprofit for that specific disease. Um, we have a program at NORD where we help uh, with uh, how to achieve that in a step-by-step -step process. It's really a great program. I've been really excited to see it grow, especially over the last year. And NORD's research department is also uh, has been significantly growing over the last few years. Uh, we've been involved in research for 20 years, plus 20 plus years, uh, but it's now categorized into three different areas um, and main buckets and work streams uh, that we fund, uh, research that we support, and research we conduct. Um, we offer research grants for translational or clinical studies. These are considered micro grants, and uh, we've actually had through these grants, uh, two FDA approved treatments were developed through um, initiating, they were initially started with our grants and then they continued their work and it eventually resulted in two FDA approved uh, treatments, which is really fantastic. We've developed an IM Rare Registry Platform and Natural History Study Program. Um, it's a system that allows patients and organizations to inform and shape uh, medical research, research and, and launching high quality uh, customized registries that collects information needed um, to understand the natural progression of their disease and its patient inputted, inputted or um, caregiver. Um, original research and publications is something that we also do. Um, we do cross-disease analysis uh, and the uh, recent COVID pandemic on how that's impacted the rare disease community. We've assessed barriers and um, facilitators to diagnosis, treatment, care um, faced by patients going through these barriers. And we survey and we also have an undiagnosed registry program as well. Our education team, uh, initiative team, develops educational resources for the rare disease community. Um, it includes innovative partnerships and programs to empower patients and their families, inform students of all ages, and support the, the work of physicians and other healthcare professionals. Um, we have, through our educational department, we offer a rare disease database um, on our website, a video library on specific rare diseases, um, we offer webinar series on educational. I know recently we just did um, a, a, a series on um, gene therapy and understanding gene therapy, um, continuing medical education for medical professionals. Um, we also have a Students for Rare program, which actually helps um, from high school all the way up to the graduate level of schools to either develop at the high school level a rare disease club, um, and then at the college level, a rare disease um, chapter, a Nord rare disease chapter, where they specifically focus on rare diseases and bringing awareness to them. Our education team also sponsors and uh, creates our Living Rare, Living Stronger patient and family conference that is happening each year. It's coming uh, this June. Um, hopefully it'll be in person, but not sure yet. Uh, we also host in the fall every year, our Rare Disease and Orphan Products Breakthrough Summit which is an opportunity to hear what's on the horizon for drug therapies and um, working with that NIH and the FDA. And we have some great, uh, great speakers giving us updates on, on what's on the horizon in, in research. And next, I'd like to uh, invite everybody. So Rare Disease Day takes place on the last day of February every year. It is uh, every four years on the rarest day of the year, which would be February 29th. So this year, Rare Disease Day is on Monday, February 28th. 
And um, NORD is the official US sponsor of Rare Disease Day. And we are actually, uh, we have a Show Your Stripes campaign. So the zebra, as uh, some of you may or may not know, is has been kind of adopted by the Rare Disease community. Um, the uh, zebra stripes is, is really what represents the rare disease community. And we're encouraging people on this day to show your stripes and, and, and wear stripes and stripe out uh, and raise awareness for rare diseases, but also to join us. We have a um, virtual community gathering that's gonna be taking place on that Monday. Um, there's gonna be some great uh, guest appearances and some entertainment. And it's just a great way to come together as a united community and honor all those that are, you know, currently, you know, war warriors in the rare disease fight. And uh, I encourage everybody to, to register. I'll put, I'll drop the link to the registration in the um, chat box. That concludes my all about Nord. So I thank you um, for having me today and, and please feel free to reach out and contact me if you have any questions or need any information or resources. Thank you, Kristen. Next up, we have Dr. Spencer. Just going to share my screen with you. All right. Thank you for having me speak. Uh, I'm a physician, but I also have a PhD in genetics, and the focus of my research was in X chromosome inactivation, and that's what I'll talk to you about today. I hope to address a couple of questions. I'm going to start with just talking about how X-linked inheritance works. And the reason I'll do this is because understanding that is important for understanding what X chromosome inactivation is and how it can affect disease expression in women. Um, finally, I'll touch on a little bit um, the question that's probably most important to many of you, and that is, is X chromosome inactivation important for you or for your daughters? So let's start with the first topic. How does X-linked inheritance works? I'm gonna start very simply and work my way up. So genes for X-linked diseases are located on the X chromosome. The X chromosome is a sex chromosome, and that means that males, shown here on the right, have an X and a Y chromosome. And depending on whether or not they pass on the X or the Y, it determines whether the child is female or male. If the X is passed on to the, to the child, it, it's a female. If the, it's a Y, um, it's a male child. And one thing I want to point out, um, that may seem a little bit obvious, um, but is important for thinking about X-linked inheritance and X chromosome inactivation is the fact that females have more X chromosomes than male, the males do. Um, so when you have an X-linked disease, you have a mutation on the X chromosome. So males have the mutation here shown in purple. They have no healthy X chromosome as a backup, whereas females have the, the mutated X chromosome, but they also have a healthy X chromosome, which can sometimes be helpful to the woman. I'm gonna talk about some traditional genetics terms. Um, they're important for understanding genetics and talking about inheritance, but um, they do have a lot of problems when it comes to talking about X-linked inheritance. Uh, nonetheless, I want you to understand them. So a dominant mutation is a mutation that you only need a single mutation to cause the disease. A recessive mutation is the type of mutation where you need a, a mutation on each chromosome, uh, on two chromosomes to cause the disease. And I'm sure most of you know that a carer is a person who has a recessive mutation on one chromosome but does not manifest symptoms of the disease. Um, and you know, one of the reasons these genetics terms are not as useful for X-linked inheritance is because some women who've been traditionally classified as carriers of recessive mutations also have disease symptoms, as you've heard today from numerous speakers. Um, I want to show you how X-linked dominant inheritance, dominant inheritance works. Um, there's two families shown on this slide. On the left-hand slide, there's a, a family where the male um, is the one with the mutation and he has the disease because it's a dominant gene. You only need one copy. Um, he passes on that X chromosome to both his daughters and both of them uh, get the disease. On the right-hand side, it's the mother who has the mutation on her X chromosome she passes it on to both male and female children and they both get it. This is a little bit different from X-linked recessive inheritance. On the left, I show um, the family where the father has the mutation. He passes it on to all of his daughters. And in this schematic, the daughters are called carriers and are considered to be unaffected. On the right-hand side, again, this is the traditional view. The mother has a single uh, mutation. 
Um, she has a, a backup healthy X chromosome and is considered a carrier um, and does not have the condition. She passes on her X chromosome to both male and female children. And um, in this schematic, only the males are affected. So th these genetics terms, dominant, recessive, and carrier are limited because they don't really ad address the important question of why women who inherit a recessive excellent mutation can have disease symptoms. And I just wanna put forward a couple of ideas for, that, that might help you think about this question. And first, um, you know, I don't think that um, the idea of dominant and recessive, um, it's so black and white, it's kind of an oversimplification. There's actually multiple factors that um, can determine whether any given disease is manifested. And I wanna give as an example, baldness, which is not a disease, but I think it's a good example. Uh, there's many genes that contribute to baldness. Um, but in these two individuals that I've shown on the screen, they can have the exact same baldness genes, but it's only the man who shows the baldness. And that's because you need a, another factor in order to manifest baldness. You have to have the male type hormonal environment. Um, another idea that I want to put forward is that the fact that I think some recessive genes may have been to some extent misclassified, and I'll, I'll give hemophilia as an example. It's still referred to as a recessive gene in the literature, um, and I think that's because, you know, think back to the 1800s, there weren't a lot of surgeries, so people didn't have a lot of bleeding related to procedures, but it was very easy to notice that um, a boy who got circumcised um, who bled a lot and who had um, bleeding into his joints as a young boy, um, it's easy to see that, that that is part of a disease. Whereas women, since they never had surgery, they might just have heavy periods and then have a major hemorrhage when they gave birth. And um, back in the 1800s, that might've been too subtle for people to recognize as being part of the same disease process. Whereas now uh, we can see that it is part of a spectrum of the same disease. So maybe recessive isn't quite the right word for it anymore. Um, the final idea I wanna leave you with is this idea of X chromosome inactivation. And this is a process that can alter the percentage of cells that express the disease gene. And I'm gonna talk a lot more about that. So what is X chromosome inactivation? Um, every, every woman, uh, every cell in a woman's body has two X chromosomes and one of those X chromosomes um, gets shut off or, or is inactivated. Um, and each of those inactivated X chromosomes express only about 15% um, of the genes. So 85% of the genes on that inactive X chromosome are silenced. And this happens in every cell of uh, a woman's body. Um, the active and inactive X chromosomes look really different um, and act really different. Um, on the top, I've shown an active X chromosome. The blue squiggle loosely drawn is meant to be the chromosome. It's loosely packed. Um, it, um, the, the yellow dots are intended to be some proteins in there holding it into its structure. Um, and the bottom line is that because this uh, chromosome is more loosely packed, the cellular machinery has access to it and proteins can be made. So it's, it's considered active. Um, this is in contrast to the inactive X chromosome. It's very tightly packed. It's a mass of DNA, RNA, and proteins, and the cellular machinery can't get in there um, to make proteins. So um, it's very inactive. And I've left a couple loops off to the side because I just wanted to remind you that um, not all of the inactive X chromosome stays inactive. There's always a few loops out there um, that are making protein to some extent. So 15% of the genes escape and express some protein, maybe not the full amount of protein, but do express some. X inactivation is a process that happens very early in development. It happens at the blastocyst stage, and the blastocyst is a ball of about two or 300 cells. Um, each cell in the blastocyst here, this is a female, has, has two X chromosomes, and I've depicted them in black and in orange to indicate which parent they came from. So the orange X chromosome comes here from this male cat. The black X chromosome comes from the um, female cat. Um, when each cell uh, in that blastocyst undergoes X inactivation, um, it decides to leave one or the other X chromosome active. And I've depicted that as making the cells orange or black, depending on whether the, the male or the mother's or the father's X chromosome got inactivated. And it makes what we call a mosaic pattern. Once, once the cell has made that decision of which parent's chromosome to inactivate, every descendant of that cell um, continues that same pattern. So each black cell in this picture 
will continue to be a black cell as it divides. All of its all of its daughter cells will will continue in the same X chromosome and activation pattern, all the way into adulthood. And you can see um, that this pattern um, can be seen in the fur of cats. And this is an actual process um, caused by X inactivation, um, where depending on whether the mother's or the father's X chromosome got inactivated, the fur is either orange or black. And you can see that it's a pretty random process. Uh, because every calico cat has a different fur pattern. Humans undergo the same process and have the same kind of patchy skin, um, but we can't see it normally because most people's um, skin color is not determined by the X chromosome, but there is an X-linked disease called incontinentia pigmenti, where there is a, a pigment difference in the skin. You can actually see the, the patchy pattern in a human, and I've shown that here. Um, the process of X chromosome inactivation at the blastocyst stage is, is random, meaning that when that cell, when that single cell makes the decision of, of which parents X to inactivate, um, it, it's a random, it's sort of a 50-50 chance, like a coin toss, which parents X will be shut off. That's most of the time. Um, but in any random process, just like when you flip the coin four times, you don't always get a 50-50 ratio. Here on the bottom coin flip, there's one heads and there's three tails, and that's called skewing when it's not an exact 50-50 ratio. So now let's move on to this idea of, um, or the question of how X chromosome activation can affect disease expression in women. Um, so First of all, if you have a, a single disease gene, it's going to end up either on an active X or an inactive X in each cell. And if the disease gene ends up on the active X chromosome, which I've depicted here as this loose squiggle, um, that disease gene is more likely to cause symptoms. Um, if it ends up on the inactive X chromosome, which I've depicted here as this dense mass, um, again, the cellular machinery wouldn't have access to that gene. Um, it would be inactive, unable to make its, its protein, the, the defective protein. Oh, and then that would result in uh, the carrier being less likely um, to develop symptoms if the disease gene is on the inactive X. Um, so I mentioned skewing a little bit when I was talking about the coin toss. So what does it mean to have skewed X inactivation? And, and what it means is that one of the X chromosomes was shut off more often than the other. And again, you can see this in the cats. The cat in the middle has about a 50-50 ratio of which parent's X chromosome got shut off. So about half of the mothers and half of the fathers, and, and it's about half orange and half black. But the cat on the right shut off the, X, the, uh, the orange X chromosome much more often than the black one. And the cat on the left, if you ignore the white patch, which has nothing to do with the X chromosome, you can see it tends to have more orange than black. So it went in the opposite direction uh, than the, the, the cat that ended up mostly black. So these two cats on the right and the left uh, ended up with skewed X inactivation. So there are a couple of different causes of skewing. One is just the random chance, like the coin flip here, where I show you get one heads and three tails instead of a 50-50 ratio. Um, and any, but anytime something happens by chance, um, you can expect it to fall on a normal distribution, which is depicted in this dark black curve here on the right. Um, and in this graph, you can you would expect that most women would fall kind of at the center um, where the peak is, and where with the 50-50 ratio of the mother's versus the father's X chromosome being shut off. Um, but in this random process, you can see the curve continues off to the right or the left, and some proportion of women will be out at the periphery of the curve and will have skewed X inactivation. Um, in gray shown on this graph, this is real data from a study. The the gray bars um, indicate what they found. And you can see there are a bunch of large peaks off to the right there, um, showing that there were women with skewed X inactivation. And on the far right, there are two women who had 100% one, skewed X inactivation, meaning they always shut off their mother's X chromosome in every cell. Um, now, why would you have such extreme skewing if it's a random process? Well, sometimes it's actually not random. It's like a weighted coin flip. And um, to describe this, uh, imagine if you glued the co a coin to the back of a cat and then you threw the cat in the air a thousand times, well, you would get heads a thousand times because it's a it's like a weighted coin flip. The cat always lands on its feet. And um, similarly, some people have X chromosomes um, that have a feature like a structural change or a lethal gene or some other feature that makes them um, much more likely to be inactivated or may make them always be inactivated or they could also conversely always be active rather than inactive. 
another cause of skewing of exon activation is um, uh, the process where you have a growth advantage um, that comes with one X chromosome uh, rather than another. And so to depict this, um, if you see on the left, there's the blastocyst, it has a 50-50 ratio of orange and black cells. But then as it grows, um, the, the orange cells are able to grow faster. Maybe they're the ones that are the healthy cells. Um, and so on the far right, as this embryo continues to develop, it's, it becomes almost all orange because the, the, the black cells are not growing as well. Um, and this is a process that can continue to happen as we age. And we do know that, that skewing change does change as you age, you're more likely to become more skewed. Um, and part of that is because, um, you know, if you, if you think about like blood cells, they're continually dividing and being renewed and replenished. And so those, any growth advantage, um, that one X chromosome may confer may, um, continue to become more and more as you age because it has more time for that growth advantage to become apparent. Uh, another possible cause of skewing is, is the idea that um, an organ or a person might develop from only just a few cells. Um, it has been estimated that um, only about 20 cells from the blastocyst go on to form blood. And you can imagine that what if it just by chance 18 of those cells happen to be black, well, then your blood would end up being made mostly of the black cells and you'd have very skewed um, X inactivation in, in your blood. Similarly, um, when you have identical twins, those form when, when the embryo splits. And if it happens just so that one of the twins, is, the cells that split off are mostly orange as I've depicted here, then you may end up with one twin having very, very skewed X inactivation and the other twin might have, for example, 50-50. Now, I don't think that this is um, necessarily an important mechanism in all diseases, particularly since organs tend to be made up of, of such mixed cells in terms of X inactivation status. And I'm gonna just uh, share a different screen with you here, just to show you. Um, this is a study uh, where they were able to, um, oh, I can't see it, here it is. This is a study where they were able to um, stain the cells to show whether it was the father's X or the mother's X uh, that was inactivated. And you can see in all these different tissues, it's a very, very mixed patchy pattern. You don't, you, you wouldn't say, like see the skin made up of completely of red cells or uh, completely of green cells. Instead, most of these tissues end up pretty mixed. And one other thing I'll point out is at the bottom here, um, they're, um, they show a bunch of different little mice and you can see there's quite a variation in terms of how green or how red the overall mouse is. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna reshare my other screen, and go back to the presentation. Okay, so moving on. Um, so just to summarize a little bit, um, so how does X chromosome inactivation uh, affect expression of X-linked disease? Well, let's start by talking about males. So people who are XY, usually will manifest the disease. Um, uh, and that's partly because they cannot inactivate their X chromosome. So the X chromosome with the mutation is all they've got. So they tend to have a, a disease if they've got a, a disease gene on their X. Um, when you look at individuals, women who are XX, um, they can vary a lot in their presentation. Whether or not the gene is dominant or recessive, they may ex express more or less of the disease gene depending on uh, whether or not their X chromosome inactivation was skewed. Um, to go over this in a little bit more detail, um, you could have women who have no disease, um, and this, that could be for a couple of reasons. One is that the healthy X may provide enough expression of the gene product that they don't get the disease, you know, partly because some, some genes are shared from cell to cell or, or you know, other reasons may allow that, that um, protein product to provide enough protein to be healthy. Um, and then the next reason I list here is other factors unrelated to the X chromosome may determine whether or not you have disease. And I, I had given the example of baldness. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see um, uh, I'm describing some of the reasons to have variable disease for people who are XX. Um, you know, I've mentioned all these. First of all, you can have skewing of X inactivation that happens at the blastocyst level. Next, you can have a growth advantage or disadvantage uh, of cells that have um, an active um, disease gene on their X chromosome resulting in skewing. Um, and finally, um, organs that are important for your disease may happen to have more cells um, with um, that have one or the other um, X chromosome inactivated. 
So that those can cause a lot of variability from person to person, um, since those um, are not going to be consistent. Those reasons are not going to be consistent from individual to individual. Um, so last, this is getting to be the last part of my talk here, is X chromosome and activation important to you or to your daughters? Well, it's really difficult to answer that. I want to talk about some of the factors. It's so exquisitely specific to your disease and your family's mutation, and then you as an individual, how you did your X chromosome and activation. Um, so some disease specific concerns are, um, does your gene escape X chromosome inactivation? If it does, then uh, X chromosome inactivation is much less likely to be important for your, your particular disease. Um, the next question is how much skewing is necessary to cause or prevent, prevent the disease? Some diseases require a whole lot of skewing in the woman before she has symptoms and other diseases require very little skewing. And so there's a, there's a lot of variability from disease to disease. Um, next, it really depends on your, your own family's mutation. Some families with a particular disease may have uh, a deletion, like a complete absence of, of the disease gene. And that's gonna, that can cause a different problem than having the, the disease gene, but it's just a little bit messed up. So it can still go participate in the cellular machinery and interact with other proteins. Sometimes that has a different effect than missing the protein altogether. Um, so you may need, so in those two instances, maybe one of those instances, you need a lot of skewing to express the disease and other, the other instance, maybe you don't need so much because maybe your, your mutation is, is much more of a problem to begin with. Um, and then next, as, as I've mentioned already, um, whether or not X inactivation is important for you really depends on whether or not your X, um, chromosome inactivation is skewed. Um, and unfortunately, that's really difficult to determine for the individual. Um, first of all, you know, if you most of the time when we test things like this, you take a blood sample, but your blood may not really be representative of the cells that are important for your disease process. And, um, you know, and, and also for that matter, how skewed your, your blood cells are may change as you age. So, so uh, taking that sample at one point in time might not actually really tell you what you need to know. And next, even if you wanted to test your X inactivation status, I think it would probably be pretty hard to get that test. I'm not sure that it's clinically available. I, I think that it's probably most likely only available as a research test. And even then, the most common test that I've seen reported in the literature is not a test that works for everyone. It, you really have to have um, certain differences on, on, on your two X chromosomes. And so if your X chromosomes are too similar for that one assay, then, then it's not a test that even works for you. Um, well, anyway, thank you for having me talk. That concludes my talk. And I look forward to um, getting questions from anybody who wants to ask a question. Thank you to all of our amazing panelists. You did an absolutely phenomenal job speaking and sharing information, and we really appreciate it. We do have some questions in the chat. Um, and we I just want to say before we get going, we have about 15 minutes for Q&A, so we may not get to all of the questions. But I do want to encourage you to go ahead and drop questions you have in the chat. We'll get to as many as we can, and then we'll save the rest, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a start of the conversation, not an end. And today we're really talking about the how and, and the why, understanding what is going on genetically that, that is causing women to manifest disease. But we have a lot more to talk about, particularly when it comes to the barriers to women getting the diagnosis and treatment. So we plan to continue that conversation and address those issues as, as a community of women who are impacted by X-linked diseases and disorders. So I want to, to let you know that there's more to come. With that, I'm going to start sharing some of the questions and we'll see if some of our speakers can answer them for us. And the first question I think could go to any of our panelists and it's asking, do you feel that part of the reason that biological females are left out has something to do with gender discrimination? Um, personally, yes, definitely. Um, I've read a lot and done a lot of research um, on my own time, just about like the history of biological women's inclusion in clinical trials. 
um, you know, up until the 90s, um, for about a 20 year period, um, women of childbearing age were actually excluded from all clinical trials. So there's just been such a long history of, you know, literally from all of time, from the wandering womb theory, where they thought that, you know, women's physical symptoms were related to um, their womb traveling throughout their body, which obviously that was like hundreds of years ago. But, you know, there's for centuries, like for all of humanity, there's 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 been all these assumptions that women's symptoms are in their heads or that they're caused by psychosomatic um, factors. And I definitely think that that plays a huge role in X-linked diseases. I truly think that if if the roles were switched and that if females were the patients and, and males were the carriers, that a lot of the problems that face our community today wouldn't be happening. Um, obviously, we can't know for sure, but I, I definitely think that it's a contributing factor for sure. Thank you, Taylor. And then this question is for Dr. Spencer. And specifically, they're saying that their daughter is a carrier for Alport syndrome, but I think this is actually a question that would apply to a carrier of any X-linked disease. What is the best way for her to have a baby without passing this on? If she freezes her eggs, can those be genetically tested for Alperts or for any X-linked disease? Uh, yeah, I think I can answer that. Um, if you know your family mutation, you can do pre-implantation diagnosis. Um, and that, what, but what you have to do is you have to um, remove your eggs, um, undergo IVF, meaning fertilize the eggs, and then develop them a little bit. They take a cell or a few cells, and then they test each embryo to see whether the gene is present. Um, and that is one, and then you would go on to implant only those embryos that, that do not have the disease gene. So that is one way to go forward. Um, you know, I know there are other ways um, to um, reproduce that don't involve IVF. Um, you can do a certain amount of gender selection. Some people elect to do termination, um, but there are a lot of options. And I know that Taylor has thought a lot about this and can talk about this more as well, but there, there are definitely options. Thank you. I'm wondering if both of you maybe could take a moment to address the psychological effects of finding out that you or your child is a carrier of an X-linked disorder or disease. I, I think that this is something that will definitely be different depending on people's family circumstances, um, depending on you know the condition, depending on the time in life that someone finds out that they are impacted with an excellent condition. Um, as I said, I don't really remember being told that I was a carrier, but that also makes me think that learning that wasn't some like traumatic um, thing for me. If I don't even remember when I was first told, um, you know, my mom would be able to speak better on this because she was the one who handled like how she approached this um, to me. Um, we were also lucky because, you know, I'm an obligate carrier, which means that basically like I, I'm an automatic carrier since I got the gene from my father, as opposed to if a woman were to have a daughter, then she would have a 50% chance. So we never had to go through the process of me fighting to get tested. But I honestly feel like that probably would have been more psychologically um, painful, like, you know, trying to access testing and possibly not being able to access it until I was older and then always having the weight on my shoulders of, am I a carrier? Am I not a carrier? Um, I think the conversation is never easy, especially with a daughter, but I think that there are ways that you can explain it um, in a way that, you know, a younger girl could understand. As I said, my mom drew out X and Ys and charts, and she also made me feel, you know, assured that, you know, what happened to my dad wasn't going to happen to me. Um, women with ALD, you know, they aren't at risk of, of, um, the fatal um, symptoms that men with a cerebral form of ALD do get. So I wasn't like scared that that was going to be my fate as well. Um, I think my mom did a really great job, but you know, there aren't, I don't know if HFA has a specific resource for like talking about this with daughters. Um, they, they might, um, but this is also something remember the girls um, hopes to address because 
right now, only research I found is on talking about like a BRCA mutation or a potential like um, other like more common mutation that could be passed down, which those articles could be helpful because, you know, it is a similar type of conversation, like talking to someone about their genetic risk. Um, but I think we always need to keep the mental health and psychological aspects in mind. Yet I'm a really strong believer that knowledge is power and even something that, you know, is neg like is 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 negative, like being a carrier, you can really take that information and empower yourself to use it in your decision-making processes, um, even at a young age. Thank you for the question. Dr. Spencer, did you want to add anything to that? Oh, and you are muted. <laughs> no, I, I don't think I have anything to add, thank you. Um, so we have a couple questions, Dr. Spencer, coming in on nomenclature, which I know is definitely a hot topic when it comes to X-linked diseases. And, and one is kind of asking, um, why do we continue to use the 50% chance of passing bad genes on when we know that genetics don't really support 50-50 in, you know, I guess just the way things work in real life. Um, and that it's pretty unique per person. And then another person is asking along the same lines, is X, in, is X chromosome inactivation really the correct term? Should we use X chromosome predomination? And I guess, what can we do with the nomenclature to better support accurate diagnosis and treatment of women is ultimately, I think, what it comes down to. Well, I think that with when it comes to X-linked diseases, I think the most important thing is that we need to give up the words dominant and recessive. I, I think we need to just say X-linked inheritance. And, um, you know, unfortunately, those, those words dominant and recessive are, are so ingrained in genetics teaching. It's, it's what you learn when you're in high school, when you're in college. Um, and so I think it's hard to give those words up. I think, um, you know, and it's confusing because some of the classic genetics is true. You know, if you have a disease mutation on one X chromosome, you do have a 50-50 chance of passing that X chromosome on if you're, you know, uh, if, if you're passing it on. Um, and, and then it's, it's the X chromosome inactivation part that's not necessarily 50-50. Um, that can be skewed. It's it's a random process for most people. So even even though we think of it as a 50-50 chance, it's it really can end up the result can end up being skewed. Um, I think that the the greater issue is not so much this 50-50 ratio of X inactivation. I think it's more that um, X inactivation is a newer field. I think people don't think about it as much. You know, they think about the classic genetics more, and I think it's it's only recently that people are starting to think about X inactivation as being a factor in um, disease expression. And you know, medicine's a process, and I think it will just take time for that information to disseminate. And I think the most important thing will be, you know, in the literature to just get rid of the words dominant and recessive. Um, I, I was looking at hemophilia and up to date, which is one of the main medical resources that we use clinically. And um, it's, we're at an intermediate stage. Like at the beginning of the article, it talks about hemophilia being recessive, but then it also has a big section on women. So it's, it's sort of in the middle still. It's, it's recognizing the importance of women, um, but it's still hanging on to some of the old language. Thank you so much, Dr. Spencer. I know that this will, I know that again, this is just the beginning of the conversation, particularly when we're talking about nomenclature and the need to, to shift. And you're right, even in the articles, we see that we're contradicting ourselves sometimes. And maybe that's part of our process as we walk over that bridge to more inclusion and more understanding of the process. Another question that came in, um, I'll read it word for word, for genetic counselors passionate about improving care in this space, what things do you feel we would be well positioned to help with beyond providing the care, correct care and counseling for our individual patients? Um, I'll take this question. So 
we have, um, remember the girls has a lot of genetic counselor support. Um, well, we have a few genetic counselors on our medical advisory board, but we also have multiple genetic counselors who are helping with specific projects. We have, I think, six of them who are helping with the family planning toolkit and are always looking for more experts in that space um, to assist um, in that capacity. I personally am also connected with a lot of genetic counselors, particularly on um, Twitter. I find that gene chat, um, the genetic counselor hashtag is really like a great way to advocate. And they're so often sharing things about Remember the Girls. A lot of them shared the link to this webinar, which is maybe where uh, you came across it. So I think using social media, you know, which is something that you can do, you know, to advocate, yes, as part of your practice, but also just for the greater X linked and genetic disease or, you know, any subset of, um, of, you know, conditions that that you focus on in genetic counseling is a great way to do it. Thank you, Taylor. And then I think this is going to be our last question because we're running very close to time. Um, Dr. Spencer, I want you to answer this as, as um, an MD. Some people are asking, and one specific question is saying that some hematologists have said that they advocate for not doing genetic testing because it could have implications. For example, a girl might need paperwork to release them to be able to play sports, or it might somehow be adding more medical reality. They said medicalizing girls. And I guess my question to you is, how do we deal with this? We know that there there are parents and, and potential patients really wanting answers and wanting to get testing. And sometimes there seems to be a barrier there from the medical community. So what would you say to them? Yeah, you know, I, I've seen people voice that barrier and I, I'm really um, in disagreement with the idea of not testing girls. Um, as an anesthesiologist, specifically with hemophilia, I wanna know what your status is when you come to me for your emergency surgery. I think that's absolutely important. Um, you, you could argue for some diseases that maybe there is no medical reason you really need to know, but, um, uh, but I think it's so important for, you know, thinking about your future and for planning um, to know. And I, I feel like making people wait until they're 18 is not necessarily required. I think, um, you know, kids are pretty resilient and I think learning early will give you a long time to think about it and learn about it. And um, also, you know, how, I'm speaking as a scientist, not an MD here, but how can you ever um, include these girls in the science if they aren't identified? How can you even, um, you have to identify a population, a study population before you can study it. Um, so I think it's, I think it's a good idea to find out earlier. And I don't really agree with this idea of over-medicalizing kids, I know it could happen, but I think it's so individual to the family and to the girl um, that I, I don't think that that alone is a reason to not find out. I, I feel like there's a lot of positives to finding out, but there are many physicians who don't feel that way. And, you know, you don't have to be a physician either. I, I have this debate with my husband all the time. Um, you know, I, I myself have a, a different gene, not X-linked, and um, underwent testing, but my husband says he would never undergo testing for anything he wouldn't want to know. So, and he's not a physician. So we're, we're two ends of the spectrum. And I think that every family is going to be different in that respect. And I think some physicians may be projecting their own feelings um, onto the, the problem. I couldn't agree with you more, <laughs> Dr. Spencer. So thank you so much for answering that. And do know that, that this is certainly part of the topic that we want to continue discussion on. When do we test? How do we test? Why do we test? And, and really looking at medical knowledge and empowerment in, in those areas. So with that, it is 5.30. I want to respect everyone's time. We are thrilled that you came. We are thrilled that so many of you um, are still here and were with us for the entire 90 minutes please be on the lookout for more. And then I'm going to ask one of my colleagues to drop into the chat our March webinar. 
is titled Mild Matters, and we're going to be looking at the struggle that individuals with mild bleeding disorders face. And we're going to have two wonderful presenters. We're going to have Becca Heckathorn from OHSU, and we're going to have Brooke Towns from IHTC talking about the, the struggle with um, treatment at, for people with mild bleeding disorders. So thank you all. I am so glad that you were here with us. Our panelists were amazing. Um, you are getting a lot of shout outs panelists in, in the chat. So take a look at that um, and a lot of thank yous. And we just look forward to seeing all of you next time. So thank you all for tuning in. And with that, we're going to go ahead and close the webinar.